joining. Thank you for everyone for uh, joining us this evening. Uh, we will be recording this lecture, as you just heard, and we will be sending it out to everyone who's registered. Uh, if, so if you did miss it, uh, this will be sent out to you. Uh, today's virtual lecture will be given by Dr. Samantha Mastanduno. Uh, she's one of our new interventional spine and sports physicians here at Rothman Orthopedics. Uh, Dr. Mastanduno uh, specializes in the injuries within the spine and the neck and is currently seeing patients at our Madison Avenue location. Um, that is 645 Madison Avenue. Uh, Madison, Dr. Mastanduno is a born and raised New Yorker and, is also, and she's also completed all of her training within New York uh, from her residency at NYU uh, within physical medicine and rehabilitation, along with her fellowship from Hospital for Special Surgery. Uh, today's topic that she'll be discussing is what you need to know about the interventional spine injections, uh, such as epidurals, medial branch blocks, and uh, RFA, radiofrequency ablation. If you do have any questions throughout the lecture, I please ask you to type them into the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. Um, and then I will now turn this over to Dr. Mastanduno. Thank you very much, Reggie. Um, thank you everyone for being here. Let me just share my screen and I can get started. Just... All right. Okay, so uh, thank you all for joining for this presentation. So I'll be going over what you need to know about interventional spine injections. So just a brief overview of what we'll uh, touch on. So I'll go over a brief uh, basic anatomy of the spine, um, as well as reviewing the common procedures and indications, including epidural steroid injections, medial branch blocks, and radiofrequency ablation. Also touch on post-injection care and some common questions. And so really I want this, uh, this presentation to be helpful for anyone who might uh, think that they will benefit from an injection of any sort and kind of what to expect along the road. And uh, just a disclaimer that this, every patient is different. Uh, the treatment plan will be customized based on their presentation and underlying pathology. And this is just to give an overview of what to expect with these injections. So to go over the spine anatomy, uh, there's different regions of the spine. Uh, that's at, up at the top, which your neck is the cervical spine. The thoracic spine is below that where the ribs are attached. And then further down is the lumbar spine or low back that, uh, and into the sacrum and coccyx. At each of these spinal levels, uh, a spinal nerve does exit. And uh, for the nerve roots that are exiting at those levels, that's what is going to be innervating the muscles and the sensory information into the uh, upper extremities and the lower extremities. And so we'll be focusing on the cervical and the lumbosacral areas since this is where most patients have uh, most common issues or complaints. Just to review the basic limb motor and sensory innervations for the upper extremities, uh, those are the upper limb muscles are innervated by C5 to T1 nerve roots and the lower extremities are innervated from, by the L1 to S3 nerve roots. Um, a myotome is going to be the muscle group that is innervated by a single nerve, and a dermatome is going to be uh, that area that is the sensory area that is detected by that single nerve root. And so this picture on the side of the screen here just shows kind of where that sensory information, where that sensory pattern is located along the body. And this is something that we use as kind of a general map uh, to aid us in figuring out where we think the pain is coming uh, for a patient. We to figure out what nerve root is affected. And so the relevant structures that we're gonna be going over today, uh, first is the intervertebral disc, uh, followed by the intervertebral foramen, the nerve root, the epidural space, facet joint, and medial branch. And so on the side here, we have a picture of the lumbar spine, uh, the side view on the left side is the front of the spine and the right side is the back. And we see the bones stacked up on top of each other. Uh, those are the, the vertebral bodies. In between each is the intervertebral disc. Towards the back of the spine, you have a, a hole or the foramen, and that's where the nerve root is going to be exiting. And that's where it can get into a little bit of trouble where it can be a source of pain. Uh, behind that, as part of the 
posterior aspect of the foramen is the facet joint. And that is innervated by the medial branch that's coming off the spinal nerve. And so all of these are kind of going to be affected in certain pathologies and that's what we'll review later. And so again, this is just looking at the spine, a cross-sectional uh, area looking down. We have the vertebral body uh, or the bone that's on the top of the screen, the spinal cord in the middle with the nerve roots exiting out each side. And I've highlighted where we see the spinal cord, the epidural fat, um, as well as the nerve root. And so the epidural fat is really going to be a key area that we're gonna be focusing on um, and where you, an injection would be going, for example, for an epidural steroid injection. And this is again, just another close up showing um, the, the anatomy here where we have the bones stacked on top of each other again in the lumbar spine and where the spinal nerve is exiting. And so this picture just shows a, a comparison between the healthy spine and a spine with spinal stenosis or narrowing. Um, patients can experience pain from their, when their healthy spine starts to de degenerate due to aging or due to injury. And that's when patients can start experiencing some low back pain. Um, I do like this picture because it does show some common uh, reasons for low back pain and where it's affecting the spine, kind of a good overview. Um, and so for example, here we see that patients can have a herniated disc and that can protrude into the foramen and compress the spinal nerve. They can also get bone spurs or overgrowth of the bony uh, of bone in the vertebral body, or they can have that same um, thing happen at the facet joint in the back of the spine and start to cause some narrowing at the posterior aspect of the foramen. Okay. And so to review epidural steroid injections first. Um, so with an epidural steroid injection, the goal is to suppress inflammation of the nerve roots and to treat radiculopathy. So radiculopathy is uh, irritation to a nerve root in the neck or the low back. And typically patients will present with radiating pain either down their arm or leg. Uh, and they can have this with or without neck or back pain respectively. Uh, patients can also have weakness and uh, or sensory changes such as tingling and numbness in the same distribution. Um, but the main uh, issue is going to be the inflamed or irritated nerve root. And just to show kind of the pattern of where patients usually get, uh, have the pain, uh, the pattern, for example, for the cervical issue would be, can be along the, um, the shoulder blade and down the arm uh, for any of the upper cervical, sorry, the lower cervical uh, nerves that may be irritated. And then for the, the leg, for the lumbar area, they can have pain radiating down the leg anywhere in that distribution. And so patients often can have pain along the entire distribution that's shown here, or they can have it in kind of patchy areas along that area, along that distribution. And so again, when evaluating a patient, we're looking at their whole history, what's been happening, what symptoms they're experiencing and kind of trying to narrow down where we think that uh, a nerve root is, which nerve root is being compressed or irritated. And so we touched on this a little bit uh, just before, uh, but some common causes of radiculopathy are uh, any kind of change to the spine that can cause irritation to the spinal nerve. And so in this picture on the side here, we see a herniated disc that can go into the foramen and cause some compression to that nerve. It can also happen with the bone spurs, that overgrowth of the bone due to arthritis in the facet joints or some thickening of the ligaments in, along the spine as well. However, it doesn't always have to be a compressive pathology that causes uh, radiculopathy or radicular pain. There can be an inflammatory component. Um, they found that when a patient has a herniated disc or if they have a tear in the, the outside of the intervertebral disc, and some of the inner substance leaks out, that substance is very irritating to the body and that in it of itself can cause an inflammatory response and can cause those radicular symptoms as well. So even if there's a slight disc bulge and it's not making contact with the nerve, then that can still cause some radicular symptoms. So who should get an epidural? So patients with radicular symptoms um, are, would be a good candidate. 
uh, if they have discogenic pain, meaning they just have pain coming from the disc itself, either a tear in the outline of the disc, um, sometimes it can be helpful for that. Or if they have spinal stenosis with neurogenic claudication. And so what that means is if there's narrowing of this, either the central canal, spinal canal, or along um, the, the exiting nerve roots, uh, and they're experiencing a lot of leg heaviness, if they feel better when they are bending forward, that might be a good indication that uh, they could benefit from this as well. Also, we're thinking about doing an epidural on patients who are, they have symptoms that are refractory to conservative care, or they're unable to tolerate physical therapy due to radicular pain. And so the goal of the injection at that point would be to provide some pain relief so that patients are able to participate with physical therapy. Additionally, epidurals can be useful for surgical planning for a surgeon um, if they're looking to do a discectomy or um, some kind of other intervention that they wanna see if it will be helpful. Um, they can often ask for an epidural to see which level to target. So some positive predictors for uh, patients who will do well with an epidural are if they have radicular pain. So meaning they have more of that pain into their leg or arm compared to low back pain or neck pain. Um, if they've had shorter duration of symptoms before their injection, usually less than six months of symptoms, they usually do well uh, with, with an injection. Um, and also if a disc herniation is the cause of, the, of their radicular pain. And so that's instead of, for example, the facet joint arthritis causing compression to the nerve or slippage of the vertebral bodies on top of each other. So other considerations that uh, we keep in mind when deciding if a patient would benefit from an epidural, if that's something that we should do. Um, you know, we want to look at each in patient's individual presentation, their history, their physical exam, if they have any comorbid conditions and their imaging findings. Um, and these are some other aspects as well. So for example, with steroid burden, we don't want to keep giving patients too much steroid. Um, we want to make sure that it's an appropriate dose and that you're not getting it too frequently just because it has its other risks as well. Um, so for example, if a patient has osteoporosis, we might be a little more hesitant to give uh, epidural or um, provide steroids just because it can progress the osteoporosis. Um, also patients with diabetes or high blood pressure, giving the steroid and the injection, sometimes they can see a, a short increase, a little bit of an increase in those, either their glucose finger sticks in a patient with diabetes or in their blood pressure in patients with hypertension. Again, that's usually transient though. Um, and we do wanna weigh the risks and benefits of any of these treatment options before deciding. Uh, we also consider how many injections they've had in the past, if they've had frequent injections, um, before, you know, from a different provider before they're seen by me. Um, if so, I wanna know what was done, how many did they have, um, how much pain relief did they experience in the past and how long uh, did that last in terms of, was it only a week versus several months? Um, those all play a part. And then with contrast allergy, that's also a consideration. Uh, we wanna weigh the risks and benefits because Contrast, it's a clear fluid that we can see on x-ray and that helps uh, identify where the medication is flowing in when we're doing, doing the injection. And so it's just another safety factor that we, we like to use. Um, and also if a patient has a bleeding disorder or if they're on anticoagulation, again, we wanna weigh the risks and benefits for any of these, uh, these procedures and discuss either with their cardiologist, their primary care doctor, if, we, if it's necessary to stop the medication or switch to another one, um, just to balance that risk. Um, but again, these are all conversations that we would have individualized with each patient. And so the overall goal of the epidural steroid injection is to deliver steroid to the epidural space that's surrounding the nerve root or disc implicated in the patient's pain in order to suppress uh, the inflammatory response and relieve pain. And so what to expect. So this is, um, this is an example of the setup and the equipment that we're using. And so for the lumbar injections, the lower back injections, um, patient will come in to the sterile, uh, under sterile conditions to the procedure suite, laying on their stomach. 
um, we're using a fluoroscope, which is an imaging technique that provides live video format of an image. And so it's a continuous low powered X-ray that allows us to see moving images. Additionally, we'll use uh, either a spinal needle or a chewing needle. They're just different types of needle depending on the injection that we're doing. And then um, the medication that will, be, that will be used and that will be discussed a little bit later. And so epidural steroid injections. Um, there's a diff few different techniques to do the lower, the lumbar um, injections. So I'll review them uh, briefly in the next few slides, but um, basically it really, the difference is where we're entering into the epidural space. So you can go either between the lamina, which is this kind of more midline procedure, a transforaminal, which is more targeted at the nerve root, or a caudal, which is at the bottom down here, um, again, more midline. And so all different techniques, all with the same goal of delivering steroid medication to the epidural space. And so the, the technique and the level that will be um, performed will be discussed with the patient and you know, decided upon by the physician that's doing the injection. Um, so I can only speak about my own process of selecting one technique versus another. And so which injection? So again, all with the same goal in mind, getting the steroid to the epidural space. Um, we are deciding, when I'm deciding about which type of injection or where, I always take into account the location of the patient's symptoms. Where is the pain radiating down? Um, what kind of pattern do they have? Is it one side versus both sides? Um, in addition to that, I wanna look at the imaging findings and correlate if it makes sense with how they're presenting. Sometimes the imaging doesn't always match up. And so we have to kind of take everything all together and how it looks um, to, to create the best treatment plan. And in addition to that, we wanna look at the imaging because we wanna avoid uh, certain levels or just kind of know what we're getting into when we're doing an injection. So for example, with an interlam, uh, laminar epidural steroid injection, when we're going more midline and from behind, we want to avoid the level where there's a disc herniation, just because that can be a little bit tight in that area. It also, we want to look at how, um, how much stenosis or how much narrowing there is either centrally in, um, or where that nerve root is exiting, because that can affect also if we'll be able to get into that area. Um, we also want to take into account if a patient has had prior spine surgery, uh, since there could be a hardware obstructing the view, or um, if they have disruption of the ligamentum flavum, which is the ligament at the posterior aspect of the spine, we're unable to do an interlaminar procedure just because we're relying on that ligament to provide um, a change in pressure uh, essentially when we're performing, when I'm performing an interlaminar technique, we're, I'm relying on that ligament for that pressure change and to know when I'm in the epidural space. So that's, uh, if patients have had spine surgery and that's no longer there, then that technique would not be uh, a good technique. We wouldn't be able to use that. So for that lumbar in interlaminar epidural steroid injection, so again, it's more of a midline procedure directed slightly to one side versus the other. We usually do it at the L5-S1 level. So that's at the bottom where the end of the lumbar um, vertebral bodies uh, and above the sacrum where that starts. And so again, we need that intact ligamentum flavum because to provide that loss of resistance. And so um, the images that are on the screen now, so the top row is the upper uh, left-hand side is what we see on the fluoroscope. So it's a little bit different from an X-ray, but it is, we are looking at the bones and that, kind of darker dot right here, that's the needle hub. And so that's where we're actually directing the needle to there. And this is just a, a drawing of the same um, of the same setup. And then the bottom row, we see that contrast, which is that clear fluid we can see on x-ray that has been injected to make sure that we're in that the correct epidural space. And so that medication is flowing nicely into the epidural space. And uh, the bottom right hand picture is the same. Um, just a different view of that. The next uh, type of epidural would be a caudal epidural. And so this would be good for a patient who has multi-level or bilateral symptoms because it's a, it covers a broader area. So it's a little bit less specific in terms of delivering the medication um, to a particular nerve root, um, but it is good for patients who have severe stenosis. They're very narrow and they're very tight because 
patients don't get stenosis all the way at the bottom where we're entering the spine um, along the sacrum. Uh, we're entering through, it's called the sacral hiatus. So patients usually don't get stenosis there. So it's a good area that we can go in and provide a broader coverage. Um, this is also a technique that can be used on patients who have had prior spine surgery. And so uh, the picture at the top of the screen show uh, the fluoroscopic image of the needle entering from the bottom here, going up along the sacrum and with the drawing uh, on the right-hand side to correlate. And then the bottom row shows the same uh, needle go entering the sacral hiatus from the side view or the lateral view. Next would be the lumbar transferaminal epidural. Um, so this is going to be targeting the nerve root as it exits the foramen. So it's um, you're coming in at more of an angle to get the needle right to where that nerve root is exiting. Um, it's a more specific injection, but it is a little bit more technically challenging just because you're trying to get into a, a smaller space, um, especially if a patient has some stenosis at that level. This can also be done in patients with prior spine surgery as well. And so the top row shows that needle where its final resting place is uh, at the L5-S1 level over here, um, just kind of underneath the pedicle of the spine and into that vertebral, intervertebral foramen. And we can see that better in this, um, this drawing at the bottom, on the bottom left there, um, where it's, we're getting just right in front of where that nerve root is exiting the um, foramen there. And the bottom right-hand corner just shows uh, the contrast flow pattern, indicating that it is an epidural injection. And so um, next is the cervical interlaminar epidural injection. So same idea, same, uh, you know, we're, we're directing the medication into the epidural space of the cervical spine. Um, typically this is done at the C7T1 level, and that's just because that's the most amount of space uh, to get in. It may sp spread bilaterally because it is a smaller area as compared to the lumbar spine. Um, and so we see the needle entering at the C7T1 interlaminar space. And with this technique, again, we're using that loss of resistance technique uh, where we're going to be relying on that ligament and that change in pressure that, uh, to indicate when we're in the epidural space. And this is the drawing of um, the same Kind of fluoroscopic image over here um, and just indicating kind of where the spinal cord is that's obviously deep to where the needle is we're not touching that <laughs> and um, the bottom picture is a, a side view to show that contrast spreading along the epidural space and so the medications that are used in an epidural steroid injection first we use a local anesthetic to numb the skin um, make it sure it's uh, more comfortable when we're injecting uh, going into the putting the needle in. Um, and then we're using a contrast, which again, it's a radio opaque. Um, so that means it's a clear fluid we can see on x-ray so that we can confirm the needle placement and visualize the flow of medication. We also use usually normal saline and then a steroid. Uh, and the steroid is really what is going to be decreasing that inflammatory response. Um, the volume, the concentration and the in, on the injectate depends on the um, who's performing the injection and depends on the patient and what kind of injection we're doing. So it can vary from patient to patient or, and from provider to provider. So during and immediately after the procedure, what to expect? So once we have the patient in the procedure room, we clean the area off, uh, inject the, the local numbing medication first, and then we direct the, the spinal needle to the area that we're going. Um, once we're in that final spot and we're confirming the location of the needle with the fluoroscope. Uh, once we get into that final spot, we're going to inject the contrast first. Uh, and that's to confirm that we are in the epidural space and we wanna see that medication flowing nicely. Um, while injecting the, the, the contrast and then after we confirm the placement, we inject the steroid, patients may feel some reprodu um, reproduction of their symptoms uh, and that usually just means, especially if it's a very tight area, it could just be because we are in, we're injecting fluid and more volume into that area. So it can cause a little bit more irritation at that time. Um, but hopefully any numbing medication that we give can help kind of alleviate that, or uh, we're able to inject it a little bit slower to help mitigate that pain. And then immediately after the injection, patients may experience some arm or leg numbness um, and weakness, depending on 
if they had their, their cervical injection or the lumbar injection. Um, and this is usually due to the anesthetic. It will wear off um, usually in a few hours, just when that local numbing medication is, is working. Uh, once that wears off, then it should go back to normal. Um, we do recommend that patients have someone take them home, especially for the lumbar injections, just because if their leg's a little weak um, or a little numb, we wanna make sure that it's safe and that they're not going to accidentally uh, fall. And so again, that those symptoms should resolve in a few hours um, and patients, we monitor them in the procedure suite and record their vitals and make sure that they're able to walk on their own before we, we send them out. So after a procedure uh, for activity, um, it varies by physician, but usually patients can return to exercise as tolerated um, within one to three days, and that includes physical therapy. Um, we just ask that you tell, uh, the patient tells the physical therapist that they had an injection, just so everyone's aware. Um, and then precautions, the only real precaution would be that patients don't submerge themselves in water. Um, so no baths, no hot tubs, no pool for at least two days post-procedure. And that's just to uh, limit the risk of infection. So some common side effects after an epidural are mild injection site pain, just because we are you know, using a needle in that area. Um, patients can also have some temporary worsening of their usual pain. And this is due to that increased volume surrounding the irritated nerve. Uh, so we don't want patients to be discouraged if they felt good after that numbing medication was working and then they start to feel their pain goes back to normal or it gets a little bit worse. Um, that can happen and that doesn't mean that the, the injection didn't work. Um, they can also experience some facial flushing, insomnia, um, increased blood sugar or increased blood pressure if they're either diabetic or hypertensive respectively. And that's because of the steroid. Um, and so the other side effects from steroid, if, you, if you've ever taken an oral steroid and had some of those side effects, it might be similar with an epidural steroid injection. But um, these typically resolve in one to three days. Um, some less common side effects include a dural uh, puncture headache. And so what happens is, if, um, if the dura mater, which is this, uh, the membrane that surrounds the spinal cord, if that can, uh, that's punctured um, during the procedure, patients may get a headache uh, or some nausea that um, it's worse when they're upright and standing and relieves when they're lying down. So it's pretty rare, but just to be aware of it, um, the treatment for, for this, if it's mild to moderate symptoms, then we usually recommend rest, hydration, and caffeine. Um, and then if it's severe, uh, there is another procedure that can be done to help mitigate those symptoms um, called an epidural blood patch. Um, but it is important to note that not all headaches after an epidural injection are dural puncture headaches. Um, and so um, what to expect also in terms of after an epidural. So again, patients might feel better for a few hours following the procedure because of that local numbing medication um, before their pain may return to their prior levels or worse, like explained before. Um, it can take up to two weeks for the steroid to take full effect. Uh, so I don't, that's something always to keep in mind. Um, you know, it can take, oh, usually it starts to kick in about one to two days, but it can take up to two weeks. And so we usually have patients follow up about two weeks later to discuss the, the results of the injection. Okay, so some common questions that I get about epidural uh, steroid injections. How many injections will I need? So on average, um, well, just kind of as a disclaimer, again, patient, every patient is different. Everyone experiences different relief um, and it depends on kind of the, the pathology behind it, uh, behind their symptoms. But um, it was quoted that on average, patients need about 1.7 injections. So anywhere between one to two injections to get relief. Um, and this is why we, we want to see a patient back in two weeks to see how they're doing and kind of discuss if it makes sense to have to schedule for another injection. Um, and how long will it last is another common question. Um, again, everyone's different, but typically, ideally each steroid injection should last hopefully anywhere from three to six months of pain relief. Some patients, uh, it, it will last less time some will last a little bit longer. Um, it really varies by patient, but ideally we're looking that it provides at least three to six months of, of relief. Um, they have done studies about how long it will provide uh, relief and kind of the long-term follow-up. And it was uh, a little bit mixed in terms of the reviews um, of what patients were experiencing, but usually there's better short-term relief. And 
the goal again with this uh, with an epidural is for it to help improve pain and symptoms so that a patient is able to participate with physical therapy and kind of make those uh, make that part of their regular healing routine and kind of get back to what they were doing before that. Um, and how often can an injection be repeated? So it's usually, we try to, we wanna limit the number of injections to anywhere from three to four in a 12 month period. Um, again, we wanna consider all the other side effects with steroids and kind of weigh our risks and benefits. Uh, and you know, we wanna make sure that a patient is getting a, a good amount of relief uh, and that we're not you know, trying to do an, an epidural every month for a patient, that's just not sustainable. Um, patients ask if they need any imaging before or after an injection. And so uh, typically we need a, at least a, an MRI prior to the injection. Um, it varies by physician, but usually most want an MRI within uh, one year to 18 months. Um, may, you may require a new MRI if there was a new injury or changing the symptoms um, that started after the, the previous MRI was done, even if it had been less than a year old. Um, and imaging after an injection is not necessary. And our epidural steroid injections fixing the problem in my back. Uh, and so no, short answer is no, they are not. Um, it's not gonna be changing the structure of your spine. It's not going to get rid of any herniated disc. Uh, again, the goal is really to direct steroid medication around the affected nerve root to decrease the inflammatory response and reduce that nerve irritation um, while the body works on healing itself. And so this can be effective at reducing pain to allow patients to continue participating with physical therapy. All right, so moving on to medial branch blocks and radiofrequency ablation. And so the goal of the medial branch block and RFA are to treat the pain coming from the facet joints. And so those are the joints that are on the posterior aspect of the spine. Um, and we want to prevent the pain signaling that comes from the facet joints by blocking the nerves that innervate them. And so, again, this is kind of a, a posterior lateral like oblique view of the spine. And so these are the joints in the back of the spine there. And this, uh, this image is, is showing some arthritis in that joint. Um, so facet joint arthritis and pain can be associated with degenerative disc disease, chronic disc herniation, spondylolisthesis, which is a shifting of the, of the vertebral bodies on each other, as well as whiplash and trauma. So it's anything that's really changing the height of the, you know, the spacing or um, the alignment of the vertebral bodies on top of each other and causing irritation to those joints in the back. And so as you lose that disc height here, um, those joints get closer and uh, they make more contact with each other and creates arthritis, just like any other joint in the body. And so the facet joints are innervated um, by two, uh, by dual innervation. So in the lumbar spine, the facet joint is innervated by uh, a branch from the named level and the level above. So what that means is, so the L4-5 facet joint, um, it's innervated by the branches from the L3 and L4 nerves. And so off the nerve root, the spinal nerve that's exiting the uh, the intervertebral foramen. So it gives off a medial branch um, and that provides innervation to that joint. And then in the cervical spine, um, it also receives dual innervation and it's from the name level and the level below. So for example, the C5-6 facet joint is innervated by branches from the C5 and C6 nerves, medial branches. And so what patients should be considered for an medial branch block and radiofrequency ablation. So any patient that's presenting with what's called facetogenic pain. So pain coming from the facet joint. And so classically, this is described as extension-based axial pain. So less radiating pain and more pain just in the back or in the neck. Um, typically, there is some kind of referred pain areas coming from the facet joints. However, it's not going to be radiating as far down the extremities um, as a radiculopathy. And so facetogenic pain can be pretty complicated and the presentation may not always follow a textbook. Um, so we do need to look at the patient as a whole, their exam, their history, as well as the imaging findings to confirm the diagnosis. 
as well as um, use this procedure that I'll discuss to, um, you know, to figure out if this is, to confirm the diagnosis of the set pain. And right, so with the medial branch block and RFA, so the goal of this procedure, again, is to disrupt the nerves that are innervating the, the uh, offending facet, facet joints, excuse me. So again, same equipment, same kind of setup um, in terms of using the fluoroscope, using the spinal needle, as well as medication. And so this procedure, um, it's done in two phases. So the first phase is going to be the medial branch block. And so this is going to be a diagnostic injection. So that means it's a temporary test injection that confirms that by blocking these nerves and blocking that innervation, it reduces the patient's pain. So if it's successful, then we would continue on to the second phase. And the second phase is the radiofrequency ablation. So once we confirm that the pain is coming from these facet joints based on that test dose, then we would move on to a kind of a longer lasting relief, um, which is the ablation. So I'll just go through kind of the timeline of what that looks like in terms of the patient, um, what they can expect. So we see a patient, we expect them to have facetogenic pain. Um, we figure out where what levels we want to target um, in terms of what, what facet joints we think are involved. And so this is done based on the patient's history, their physical exam, as well as the imaging findings. And so after that, we, we want to schedule a patient for their medial branch block. So this is the diagnostic injection. So when we have the patient come in for the injection, right before the procedure, we provoke the pain. We ask patients not to take any pain medication beforehand because we really wanna make sure that we can have a high starting um, number out of 10 for their pain um, so that we can really judge it based on that of their typical low back pain, for example. Um, and we have them rated out of 10. And so with the facet joints, the way to load them is by basically extending a patient back and twisting them to one side versus the other. And that's really gonna put more force onto those facet joints. So we'll usually do that motion before the injection and have them rate it. Um, and again, we want it to be a high enough number that we're able to distinguish if there was an improvement in the pain. So we perform the medial branch block. Um, and so what this entails is injecting a local anesthetic around the medial branches. And so the picture on the top here is kind of an oblique view of the spine and where we're targeting the, the medial branches, where they wrap around um, the around the facet joint. And so we're targeting that, going to inject the local anesthetic, and this should temporarily anesthetize the targeted facet joints. And because we're doing, because the facet joints have dual innervation, whenever we're targeting one facet joint, it's going to be a minimum of that, the two injections, um, but it's really only treating one joint at a time. And so after the injection, after we inject the local anesthetic, we provoke the pain again, and we want to have them rated again out of 10 um, and see if there's any improvement. We'll continue to have patients rate their pain over the next few hours, either by um, writing in it like a pain diary to monitor their progress, or even just kind of keeping note of it. Um, and then they can email their results back to us or call the office the next day. But we just want to have some way of tracking if they've had uh, improvement in their pain. During this time, we want patients to continue their normal activities um, and do things that would normally cause them pain because we want to see that they've actually experienced some relief from that injection. Um, once we get the their pain diaries or their post-injection pain relief score uh, back, we want to compare the pre and post-injection scores. If there was a significant improvement, then we consider that a successful medial branch block. And so depending on the physician preference and mostly insurance, um, we might need to repeat the medial branch block. So that means we have to do another test um, diagnostic injection to really confirm that the pain is coming from their facet joints at the suspected level. After that, um, we can go proceed with the radiofrequency ablation. And so now that we've confirmed that the facet joints are causing the pain, we can provide a longer lasting treatment. And so from the patient experience side of things, it's relatively similar to what the medial branch blocks, um, what that looks like. So again, laying down flat on their stomach and directing the needle to the same area. However, this is a little bit different because when we're putting, placing the needle at the targeted area, we want it to be parallel to the medial branches. And that's because the needle that we're using for the RFA, the tip of it can heat up 
And so that's what's going to be cutting the, the medial branches. So it's providing a lesion to, that, um, to the nerve to block that innervation and cut the medial branch so that the facet joints cannot receive any pain innervation or pain, pain feedback. Um, and after the procedure, so after the radiofrequency ablation, um, there's no restrictions. Again, we just wanna be mindful that you did have an injection and we don't want you to submerge yourself in water for another two days. Again, limit that risk of infection. Um, and what to expect. So it can take up to six weeks for the ablation to take effect. Uh, that's just how the nerves are, um, uh, the way that the innervation works. And it, it, there's nothing really to do that we can do to speed this process up, unfortunately. Um, about one in 200 patients will experience a sunburn-like sensation around the injection site, and that's due to the sensory innervation from the medial branches. Uh, but what I've heard from patients is that they're more than happy to trade their back pain for this sunburn sensation. Um, also, it's important to note that with the medial branch blocks, uh, with that numbing medication, the test injections, we also ask that patients don't resume their pain medication during that time while the anesthetic is working. But after the radiofrequency ablation, they can continue their pain medication as normal, what they were usually taking. Um, so after the procedure, um, so after the six weeks that it can take for that to really take full effect, um, how long will it last? So it can usually last for about nine to 12 months. However, um, you know, peripheral nerves can regenerate themselves. And so that's the medial branch nerves uh, can re innervate the facet joint by nine or 12 months after the procedure. So some patients will get longer relief or some will get a little bit shorter relief depending on how quickly their nerves re innervate the facet joints. But it does provide that longer relief um, than with, for example, the medial branch blocks, that's just that test injection. So some common questions that we get from patients. So will the ablation hurt? And so uh, when we're doing the ablation, we're heating up the nerves and we're essentially cutting that nerve innervation, we use a local anesthetic um, before and after the ablation. So they may feel, patients may feel a little bit warmth within the first 10 to 20 seconds. However, um, it should not be severe pain. If it is, definitely let the physician know and we can always give more local anesthetic. Will the pain relief after the ablation be gradual or immediate? So uh, again, the ablation can take up to six weeks to take effect. Um, patients may have a temporary pain relief immediately after the ablation, again, due to that local anesthetic, but it will wear off in a few hours. Uh, some patients will experience gradual improvement. However, most note that it's a clear point when the ablation started to take effect. Um, and that's just due to the nature in which nerves function and regenerate. How often can I repeat this procedure? So since uh, the time frame that nerves usually regenerate is nine to 12 months or so, we um, typically we would repeat it yearly if patients need it. Um, depending on insurance, um, patients may or may not need to repeat the medial branch blocks again. Um, and then if you're burning the nerve, is there a risk of weakness? And so the medial branches provide some innervation to the deep muscles of the spine called the multifidi. Um, patients shouldn't experience true weakness in their backs after the procedure, um, but it is something obviously to be aware of. Um, we are also staying away from the spinal nerves that innervate the muscles in the lower extremities or upper extremities. So those will not be affected. And to make sure that we're not affecting those nerves, um, we have another safety check in point where prior to burning the nerves during the radiofrequency ablation, we confirm that the needle's in the correct location, not only by using the fluoroscope and um, making sure it's in the correct location. Uh, we also test the sensory and motor innervation. So during that time, we ask the patient to make sure that they're only feeling the sensation in their back or their neck and not into their extremities. And just briefly, um, so that was it for the medial branch block and the radiofrequency ab ablation. And then briefly, I'll just go over facet steroid injections. And so these are going to be um, same indication as the radiofrequency ablation. However, this is just instead of severing the nerves or blocking the nerves that provide innervation to the joint. 
Um, this is injecting steroid directly into the facet joint to reduce inflammation and reduce pain. Similar to if, you, um, if patients have received steroid injections into their knees for arthritis, for example. And so this is just showing kind of the setup. Again, we're in that kind of oblique view looking at, uh, at the spine to get to enter into the facet joint itself instead of targeting where the nerve is wrapping around the joint. After the procedure um, for a facet joint injection, it can take up to two weeks for the steroid to take effect. Um, usually there's no activity restriction following this injection. Um, all right, and so conclusion. So just kind of a brief overview. So epidural steroid injections, use those for the radiating neck or radiating low back pain, um, can take up to two weeks to take effect because that steroid uh, for the medial branch blocks, radiofrequency ablation and or facet joint injections, that is more targeted for the axial neck pain or axial low back pain, not so much that radicular pain that's coming from the facet joints with the MBB and RFA, that radiofrequency ablation, it could take up to six weeks to take effect, but it can last to not nine to 12 months. And then the facet joint steroid injection that can take up to two weeks to take effect. Uh, to take effect. Um, and, you know, with any of these injections, it's always important to take into account each patient's diagnosis, their comorbidities, their, their presentation, um, everything together when we're deciding what should be done. And it's important to keep in mind that just because an injection, one injection works or didn't work for a friend of theirs or someone else, it doesn't mean that it will be the same for you. And it's important to kind of look at the patient as a whole and take everything into account when deciding a treatment plan. And just some final thoughts. Um, so these injections are providing a temporary, temporary relief of symptoms and they can serve as an adjunct treatment to physical therapy. Um, patients may, again, may experience different res results depending on symptom severity and underlying diagnoses. So again, I wanna look at the patient as a whole, look at everything all together to come up with the best treatment plan. And if you'd like to schedule an appointment or uh, come be, to be seen, could do so over the, over the phone, by email or online at rothnortho.com. And thank you all very much for your, for your time and we'll open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Mastanduno. Yeah, so uh, during your presentation, we did have several questions. So uh, bear with me and I, we can walk through them together. Um, sure. and, if you, and throughout our Q&A, if you have any additional questions, feel free to type them into the Q&A uh, below. So first question is, is there ever a time you would recommend a patient to see a surgeon before scheduling an injection? Yeah, so um, anytime that we're evaluating a patient, um, if I, I would send a patient to a surgeon before doing an injection if they had any concerning signs or what we call red flag signs. And so if a patient is having severe weakness, um, you know, that's something where we need more of an in-depth look before we, we do any injection. Um, Perfect. And uh, before an, uh, someone, a patient has an, appoint, uh, an appointment, should we be getting CT scan, MRI, or will an x-ray suffice? So typically um, on a first visit, we usually get an x-ray uh, because again, we wanna look at the alignment of the spine. Um, before an injection, um, so before an uh, initial evaluation with me, uh, you don't need to get any imaging because we'll take care of that here if we need it. Before we plan an injection, we would get uh, at least an MRI beforehand. Great. Um, can uh, a patient have too many cortisone shots at one time? Is there a maximum in your professional opinion to the amount one can have at one time? So there are guidelines um, as to the amount of steroid uh, given in each injection. Um, and Again, for, for example, for the epidural steroid injection, the most injections I would do at a time would be two level epidural steroid injections. Um, but again, I would 
use the same amount of steroid that I would be using just for one level injection and just divide it among the two level between the two levels. Um, gotcha. And uh, does an epidural reduce the swelling and reduce pain or just reduce pain specifically? So it's gonna reduce the pain and irritation to that area. It's not going to reduce any kind of herniated disc. Um, it will, because the steroid will help stop that inflammatory process, it'll, yeah, it will reduce more of the inflammation and the substances that cause irritation to that area, to the nerve root, but it's not going to be reducing any of the, the disc herniation. And, uh... What is used when doing contrasting? So we use um, Omnipake usually, which is the brand of the contrast. So it's an iodine-based um, contrast where you can see it on x-ray. You can see the, the fluid. So it's a little different than the contrast that is used, um, for example, for an MRI with contrast. It's a, it's a little bit different type. Got it. Is, um... If you've had spine surgery before, uh, can you come in for injection therapies after? Um, you know, a year or two year, you know, fast forward. Yeah, so anytime a patient has had spine surgery before, we usually recommend that they follow up with their surgeon first, if just to make sure that there's nothing going on with the hardware um, and that they're all cleared from the, the surgeon side of things. Um, if they've had surgery and they still have radicular pain after that, or they have other symptoms at different levels, they can definitely come in to be evaluated. And um, it doesn't mean that they can't get an injection. We would just have to target and um, discuss what injection is the most appropriate. Of course. Uh, is an epidural spine injection the last step before a decision for surgery? Um, this uh, patient then went on to say they are suffering from severe spinal stenosis. So if so, does, doesn't it potentially impact the body uh, the same, such as blood pressure, possible weight gain, and other side effects? So in terms of the, the last step before surgery, um, it varies depending on kind of a lot of uh, different factors. Usually, if a patient is considering spine surgery, um, and if, if they're a candidate for an injection, it, it, we do usually recommend that they get the injection first, see if that provides any kind of relief um, mm -hmm. and how long that will provide a relief. Because, uh, and then ultimately it's going to be up to the patient and kind of how they're doing their side effects or um, kind of their symptoms that they're having. For example, if, again, they're having more of that overt weakness, it might not make sense for us to keep doing injections if there's something that can be done surgically to help. And that's where we have to have a discussion kind of all together with the patient, with the spine surgeon, and figure out the best treatment plan for them. Wonderful. Um, can you discuss or explain the uh, MILD procedure, M-I-L-D, um, is this a good option for lumbar, lumbar stenosis in your opinion? Yeah, so I actually, I don't do the mild procedure, so I don't really um, have much to comment on that. Uh, but yeah. Uh, is there a prerequisite for one to have the ablation for pain because of arthritic facets? Is it based on medial branch block results? So um, it's kind of a combination. Usually we want to make sure that a patient is getting good results from the medial branch block. Um, it's, we want to make sure that they're getting significant relief. Um, and so it's kind of, again, it's all very personalized uh, and it depends on what is considered significant relief. If a patient does get 50% relief from the injection from the block, then that's good enough to do, um, you know, to go on to the ablation, uh, or if they're able to tolerate standing longer than they normally would, 
I think that counts as significant relief and we can go forward with the, with the ablation. Wonderful. Um, and another patient uh, expresses that they have arthritic facets in uh, L3 to S2. If, there's, if these three procedures do not provide any relief in pain, uh, what do you suggest as an alternative? Yeah, so I mean, it, that's hard to kind of discuss um, overall because we wanna make sure if, if you are having arthritic back pain from these facet joints, it's very classic facet pain. Um, again, I would probably start with the injections discussed here. If that's not helping, I, I would wanna look into other areas of what you're doing to kind of maintain your health, spine health overall. Um, including the physical therapy aspect, your home exercises, um, looking at kind of all facets of that, as well as if that's not helping, then we might discuss doing the, um, you know, oral medications, oral anti-inflammatories. However, that's not great to be on long-term, um, unfortunately. But again, I'd want to look at all the other different um, aspects of kind of your treatment so far and what has been done and what can we help improve. Got it. Um, is uh, sedation ever given for ablation? So some physicians do provide, um, will do an ablation with sedation. However, um, I don't do that because when we are checking those nerves to make sure that we're in the correct location, um, I was trained that if we are giving a patient a sedation, we need to make sure that they're awake during that test part because I, we wanna make sure and get their feedback that we're in the correct location. Um, so it's more of a safety thing um, as far as how I was trained. Uh, one patient shared with us that they suffer from stenosis, scoliosis, and arthritis, um, and that they've had numerous epidural injections as well as RFA. Um, and have no signs of any improvement. Uh, they are uh, 80 years old, but in good health, and um, they are not able to walk more than 10 minutes without back or leg pain. Um, they, is there anything else that they can try to regain activity? Yeah, so I'm sorry that you're suffering um, with all of that. And it is kind of, uh, it brings up a good point that a lot of patients do suffer from multiple issues all at once. And so that's kind of why we have to go in a stepwise fashion to hopefully provide as much relief as possible. Um, at the end of the day, it comes down to how much those injections are helping you. Um, if you are getting any relief, it sounds like you haven't. Um, at that point, that's when I would refer to a surgeon as well. If the injections stop working, they're not as provi they're not providing as much relief, and it's really significantly impacting your activities of daily living. Um, that's when I would recommend seeing a surgeon to discuss their options. Uh, how many facet joints can have the RFA at one time? Um, typically, you can do so. They just changed some of the coverage um, in terms of insurance for Medicare, um, and they're limiting the number of injections we can do at a time. However, you can typically do three levels, so covering um, two joints on each side, like on one side at a time. Uh, another patient shared with us, they've had a lumbar epidural and they did show relief. Um, they did have their follow-up appointment two weeks afterwards, and didn't, they did not feel that they, need, they needed another one, but now they're six weeks out, and um, they feel they need the second dose. Is it too late to do this? No, I don't think it's too late um, after getting the first epidural. Um, it's more common than not to have that second epidural within the two weeks if they got only a, a certain percentage, but that happens where you don't get as much and it takes a little bit longer to get some of that relief um, or while you're doing the physical therapy and everything along during that time for that six weeks, uh, you're getting some improvement, but you've kind of plateaued. I think it's reasonable to discuss getting another injection at that time um, to consider 
yeah, doing another level. And uh, do facet injections in the upper cervical spine carry greater risk side effects? Um, and then they gave some examples of dizziness or, or occipital nerve block. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, and yes, so the upper facet joint injections, um, the, the radiofrequency ablation in particular, you can get some dizziness as a side effect um, if you're especially targeting uh, the facet joint, the nerve that innervates the C23 joint, um, that can cause some of those side effects. And if it's not completely burned, so if you only get partial burning of those nerves, so that's why we wanna make sure we do a couple of passes with the ablation to make sure we get that out completely. But it is a, a side effect or risk when we're doing those injections. Uh, can one have facet injections without contrast given a previous anaphylactoid reaction to contrast dye? So, yeah, with anytime a patient has a reaction to uh, contrast, we definitely want to take that into account. Um, if it's anaphylactoid, I obviously would not want to give any kind of um, contrast during those injections. It depends on where, the, which facet joints. For the cervical facet joints, personally, I would not do it um, without any contrast, just because the risk of doing an injection without the contrast at that point um, doesn't outweigh the benefit of the potential improvement in the facet joint um, uh, steroid injection, however. Um, and obviously, if you're having an anaphylactoid reaction, I would not give contrast. So I probably would hold off on that and um, either consider doing the medial branch block without contrast. But again, um, my preference would not be to do that. Uh, another patient asked um, if they presented and have uh, several years of lower back issues, but they are not a, a candidate for surgery, would medial branch blocks and uh, RFA be a, a alternative? Yeah, I mean, it could be, um, yeah, if, if a patient is not a candidate for surgery, again, depending on what their underlying pathology is and the source of their pain, uh, doing a medial branch block and RFA could potentially be um, a good route to go if they ha are having that facet mediated pain. Wow. Um, and then after medial branch block, uh, uh, the, these um, procedures, the uh, MBB and the uh, Radio RFA, um, how long should one wait to resume normal life activities, PT, yoga, et cetera? So for the medial branch block, um, again, we want, I want patients going back to their normal activity right away because I want them to really test out that they're getting relief from the numbing medication that's there. Um, with the radio free, so they can go back to normal activities right away. Same thing with the radio frequency ablation. Again, we're only giving uh, some numbing medication before the ablation um, to provide some pain relief um, due to the, the heat of the, the needle, um, but they should be able to return to activity right away. Um, and then what type of surgical intervention are you referring to? I was advised by one orthopedic surgeon not to proceed with surgery. Um, sorry, in terms of the surgical intervention, is that from the one with the stenosis Hi. and if you're unable to stand for a long time? So if, um, again, each patient is different and we, I would need to look at imaging and that would be a discussion to have with the surgeon. But if patient, for example, if they have a herniated disc, had an epidural, it didn't help them. And again, no red flag signs before that injection. Um, if they're having just uh, pain that will not improve, it's plateaued and it's really affecting their life and their, um, you know, their normal activities, then I would recommend that they speak to a surgeon about the surgical options. And they can give um, more of an in-depth look at to what surgical options there are. So for example, for a disc herniation, they might be able to do a discectomy where they're just removing that disc, 
or if they have some, in, or if a patient has more stenosis and that's what's causing their symptoms and kind of the same aspect where they're not getting any better, they've really plateaued and it's really affecting their lives, then they can discuss either doing a decompression or a fusion. Um, that's something that a surgeon can kind of talk to a little bit more. And again, it's very personalized to how, what a patient has. And in your studies and training, have you ever seen any negative outcomes related to RFA? Um, so I ha the most that I've seen um, in terms of that is the side effect of that patchy kind of sunburn sensation. Um, often the negative outcomes that I've seen have been just that it doesn't work, unfortunately. Even with patients, they can have that improvement with the medial branch block. Um, where it's a successful block and then we can go on to do the radiofrequency ablation, sometimes they, won't, they, they don't get the pain relief that we would expect. Um, and at that point, then we would look at to see what else is causing some of their pain. Um, and again, because they can have multiple problems going on at once. Um, and I think we have time for one more question. And uh, it's uh, any results comparing... Uh, results with, in, with injections versus acupuncture? Um, not to my knowledge, like a direct comparison. Um, I think the goal of the injection versus the goal of acupuncture is a little bit different. So from what I, you know, the epidural steroid injection, that's going to be more for that radiating pain, um, targeting more of that nerve root irritation. Um, with that, that nerve root irritation, you can get some tightness in your muscles and some pain in that regard. Um, and that's where I think acupuncture can play a role. Um, I'm fine with patients trying other, you know, modalities to help improve their pain in any way that we can. Um, but I, I don't think there's any study that really compares that I, that I'm aware of. Uh, well, I want to thank everybody for um, their time and, and joining us this evening. Uh, you know, for more information, and if you'd like to make an appointment with Dr. Massenduno, feel free to visit our website, which is uh, rothmanny.com, or uh, you can call us at 888-636-7840. Again, that's 888-636-7840. And uh, just a reminder to anyone who may have joined us late, we will be um, sending a recording out to all registrants who have attended or registered. Uh, thank you so much again for joining us this evening. Thank you, Dr. Mastanduno. I appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you all for joining.